Okay, we begin a new mimer. It was said, Parshas Pinchas, Tesain Tamas, the 16th of Tamas, Toshi Lamad Hay, 1975. And this is a, a fascinating mimer that goes through the inheritance of the land of Israel and the Jewish connection with the land of Israel on a spiritual level. It starts with a verse from Parshas Pinchas, Ach Begoral Yechalek that the land of Israel should be divided up by a lot, by lotteries. Which means that they took lotteries and they, the 12 tribes of Israel, each of whom had a portion in the land of Israel, was a portion of their section of Israel based on a lottery. So in one hat they had a list of tribes, in another hat they had a list of portions of the land. And they took one out and whichever one came out, that's the portion that you got. So the division of the land of, of Israel, the Holy Land, which was the land that they conquered after they conquered the land called Canaan and made it into Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. And the truth is, even when the Jewish people were still in the desert, they had not yet reached their term, Shabbat Eretz Israel. The land is already described even before they arrived as the land that the eyes of Hashem are on from the beginning of the year till the end of the year. It's already a holy land even before they got there. But when they got there, they made it into Eretz Yisrael. So the Torah tells us that the division of the holy land was through a lot, a lottery. Meaning, on what basis did this tribe receive this particular portion? Random. random. I mean, divinely inspired, but like, it, it's a random thing. This came out, this came to that one. A, a lottery. You wouldn't say that this tribe got that part in the north and south. Right. Oh, but how, but how do they get that part? Why, why do they get that part? How was it chosen? By lottery. Now, the Rebbe continues on the fourth line. But it says that the lottery is also Alpi Hashem, meaning by the mouth of God. In Farsh Rashi, Baruch HaKadosh, Rashi explains what that means is it was divinely inspired. It wasn't, it wasn't just randomness. It wasn't just this one gets that one. But there was Ruch HaKadosh involved as well, divinely inspired uh, direction that this tribe should get this portion of land. The Oed Inyan, Haya Bechelkas Aretz, but there's a third aspect to the division of the land. Not only was it by lottery, and also through Ruch HaKodesh, but it also says, Larav Tar Benachlosai, Velamaat Tamit Nachlosai. It also says that to the large tribe, you should give a large portion, and to the smaller tribe, should get a smaller portion. What does that mean? Right. It has to be fair, meaning it's done according to rational logic. A, a large tribe needs a large portion, a smaller tribe needs a smaller portion. Which means it's al-piseichel. It was done with intellect, with fairness, with, with judgment. So that seems clear. Shahari Pirusha Balarav Tarba. Because the simple, straightforward explanation of the bigger tribe should get a bigger portion and the smaller tribe should get a smaller portion is like Rashi explains. Um, because we know Rashi's interpretation on the Torah is the simplest explanation of the verse. And what does Rashi explain? That a tribe that had a large population needed to receive a large portion of land. Because the portions of land were not equal. There wasn't 12 equal parts of the land. There were some larger than others, some much larger than others. And that was in proportion to the tribe, that every tribe needed to get a, 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 pro a portion that was suitable for it. So, so if you're saying that the portion of land that each tribe received was in ratio to their size. 
So that means the chalukah zuhi api seichel, that it was done through intellect, through what makes sense, through judgment, what, what's fair. So there's a large portion. The, portion. the land is first divided into 12. Then we look at the 12 tribes and we say, okay, this is the biggest portion, that's the biggest tribe, so they should get that. And then here's the, here's the smallest portion that can go to the smallest tribe. Well, what was determining that the, if they had a lot and a big tribe got a small part? Right, so we, we say here there's, there's, there's three so systems of, div of dividing up the land. What comes first? It was through logic, it was through lottery, and through Ruch HaKadosh. Mm -hmm. right, I mean, this seems very confusing now. Okay, so how was it done? You should say that Ruch HaKadosh would be the first thing. Then it, when you do the lottery, the big tribe will get the piece of that. <laughs> Depends on uh, and that's all. Then, then that's all it needs. All you need to do, if it's if it's Alpi Ruch okay, it was done through divine direction. So then we don't need to participate in that. We don't need to think about this. There's no judgment involved. It's just this one goes to that one. If the girl, if the lottery itself was divinely directed, so just do the lottery and it'll work out. Why do we need to be told, oh, and give a big portion to the big tribe? That means there was some judgment involved, some human intervention. So this seems very strange. There's, there's three different ways that, that the land is divided, but it's the same land and the same people. So how did it work? So we'll for now skip the brackets. The sec the, uh, just the second last line of the paragraph. Nimsa shebachalukas are it's how gimel and yonim. So it comes out that the land was divided up in three ways. Or there are three aspects, three levels to the division of the land. Alpi Gero, through lottery. Alpi Ruch HaKodesh, through divine inspiration. Alpi Seichel, Amuvan Gamba Seichel, Nefesh HaSichlis. And according to logic, that would be understood even by the intellectual soul, meaning just a, an, any intelligent being can say, okay, that, that was fair, that makes sense. Right? Dividing land according to lottery is not logical. There's no logic why this lot came for that tribe. It's just, that's just coming out randomly. Ruch HaKodesh also is that logical. Ruch HaKodesh is a divine inspiration saying, this goes to that. No explanation. It's not, it's not that there was a calculation made. It was divinely decided. Whereas dividing up the land according to size is something that the intellect can understand. Okay, that's fair. That should go there. It seems that all three, all three happened. Just a question. Could, if everything comes from Hashem, is there actually such a thing as randomness? No, you're right. There's no, there's no such thing as randomness, meaning just happens this way. He's directing everything. Right, right. But the question is, is it directly, direct, di directly or indirectly? So, of course, Hashem is behind everything. If you toss a coin, heads or tails, who decided it should be heads or tails? Hashem? Yeah. But that's not directly, you can't say that's prophecy. You, you can't say, let's say if you're trying to decide uh, whether it's or not to, to take a job. So you say, okay, look, I'll leave it in God's hands. Heads, I'll take it, he tails I won't. And you flick a coin, and it comes out heads, so you take the job. You can't blame God now if it doesn't go well. It's not, that wasn't prophecy. God didn't tell you to do the, this way, that, that, that this is going to come out his, at his, as his will, like it's a... Uh, it's more like the Ezra, which he says that the lady will come and give you the water. That was a sign, that was a, that was a sign. That somebody who has, who has good, uh, good, good character traits, that's, that's a simple, but that's not, that's not random. He didn't just say the third girl that comes out, you know, or something, you know, something random. It was, it was, a, it was a, a sign of good, good character. So, so yeah, you're right, it's not random, but Ruch HaKodesh means that there's a divine spirit saying, this is what you should do. Lottery means that you leave it up to a lo an illogical, irrational force to decide. But behind that is... We know that behind, yeah. And, and then the third way is that you decide based on logic. Three very different forces. Let's, we'll go through the brackets that we skipped. It just mentions here that the verse that says Larav that to the greater tribe should get a, a larger portion and the smaller a, sh a smaller portion. We we understood that as Rashi understands it, which means that you should logically, fairly rational uh, ration out the land. The bracket says Vagam Ramban 
Now, the truth is the Ramban, Nachmanides, another commentary, disagrees with Rashi's interpretation of the verse. And there are even other interpretations of Rashi himself that understand Rashi as meaning something else. But the Ramban understands Rashi like we understood Rashi. Even according to the Ramban, or according to other commentaries on Rashi who understand also that Rashi is not being literal, but according to all of them, the fact that the Torah had to tell us to, that it's al-pi Hashem, that the division has to be by Hashem's prophecy, means that there is some connection to intellect. You could have thought that it should be divided up through seichel, through intellect, and therefore the Torah tells you al-pi Hashem. But what we're discussing here is not the Ramban's opinion, and not because that, that goes into deeper explanations of this division. We're going just like Rashi. Rashi, who, is, who, who understands the verses in the most simple, straightforward way, the verse seems to be saying very clearly that it should be done al seichel through fairness, through logic. That quite simply, the division was based on the number of people in each tribe, which is a rational division. So with Rashi's interpretation, we've got three ways that the land was divided. By lottery, by, by prophecy, and by rationale, by logic. So to understand what this is about, what's, what's going on here, we're going to the next section base. The Tzemach Tzedek, the third Rebbe of Chabad, explained the idea of the division of the land al What does it mean? that there was a lottery to divide the land. Why would you choose such a, a seemingly random way to divide the land up? So the Tzemach Sadiq explains, based on a maimer of the Alter Rebbe, his grandfather, the Alter Rebbe quotes what it says in the Gemara, that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, one of the great leaders after the destruction of the temple, he said the following, he was on his deathbed, and he said, I don't know which path I'm being taken. What did he mean by that? He's, he's lying on his deathbed, and he says to his students, I'm not sure which path I'm being taken on. Meaning in the world to come, mm. in the afterlife. I don't know which way I'm going, up or down. That's what he said. Which seems amazing. Who are we talking about here? The Gemara testifies that Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai never walked four cubits without saying words of Torah and without wearing tefillin. Right? He was constantly talking words of Torah, learning Torah in his, in his mind, speaking words of Torah, and always wearing tefillin as well which was not an uncommon practice in, in Talmudic times. Originally, tefillin were an all-day thing. It doesn't say tefillin you should wear for davening. It says tefillin you should wear. And so people would wear them all day. However, you're not allowed to be distracted from the tefillin while you're wearing them. While you're wearing tefillin, you're supposed to be aware of the fact that you're wearing the tefillin, not forget that you're wearing the tefillin. So, we struggle to do that for the 45 minutes that we're wearing them in the morning. It's, it's hard enough to remember that you're wearing tefillin. That's one of the reasons why we constantly cast, touch them and kiss them, to, to remember that you're wearing them, to have your mind on the fact that you're wearing them. You have to keep yourself clean and uh, in, a, in an elevated state while you're wearing tefillin. So when it became harder for people to do that because of the distractions of life, so they stopped wearing tefillin all day, and they said, okay, we'll just wear it for davening in the morning, uh, and that's it. But Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai, Never walked four cubits. Never, never moved without wearing tefillin. He was, was always wearing tefillin. Yeah, they said that. So, uh, so that means he had that level of concentration of connectedness, and he was always speaking words of Torah. And he says, "I'm not sure which way I'm, I'm going after after this world. Don't know where I'm going to end up. How, how could there even be such a thought?" 
Second last line. Rabbi Yishon Lomed Velimah Torah. For 80 years, he learned and taught Torah. He was the major Torah teacher of the generation. For 80 years, he did that. What place is there to have any doubt where he's going in the afterlife? Where does that leave us? So what was he, was he, was, was he being honest here? Was he just saying a, a nice word? Like trying to sound humble? Even humility has limits, you know, to, to, to say something ridiculous. It's not humble. So Rabbi Yerfud ben Zakkai, a person who's a clear, clearly a tzaddik, for him to say, I don't know which path I'm going and which way I'm going. So Al Rebbe questions this. What, what does he mean? What could he possibly mean? So the Altar explains a fascinating insight into it. What he means what is this, that my etzema nefesh, the essence of my soul, I don't know where it is. On the revealed level, I know I'm doing the right thing and I lived a very righteous life. But the essence of my soul, the inner core of my being, I don't know where that is. I don't know if that is holy or not. Meaning the level of the soul that is above consciousness, above awareness, above uh, that's higher and deeper and beyond the surface. That level of the soul, I don't know where it's at. That, that sounds not right. Like, no, like the deeper it is, the holier. Right, this is the opposite of what, what we usually right. say. We usually we say that even though a person <laughs> externally may look unholy and disconnected and, and no good, but in the depth of their soul, the essence of their soul is pure and holy and untouched. That's what we usually say. And so, in spite of what things look, really, they're good inside. That's true. This is another thing. There's, a, there's another aspect of that, and that's the opposite. That a person could externally look very good and very righteous and doing all the right things, but is their core holy? Or is it untouched? Is it just their external self that is doing the right thing, but internally they're not really there? They're really not really unchanged. They're just going through the motions of doing the right thing, but they're actually, in the core, not holy. And it's another possibility. It's another way it could be. Like somebody who, who behaves well, does the right thing, but it's not, it's not with pure intentions. It's not, it's, not, it's not really them. If you'd scratch the surface a little bit, or if they'd be under a little pressure, bit of pressure, or if, if things would change a little bit, or if you'd catch them off guard, then they won't be doing the right thing anymore. Or if they f have you too many lechayims, then, then you'll see what, what, what they're really about. So... So this is, this is a, different, a different level, something that we haven't heard so much about. That the etzim and nefesh may not be in the right place, even if your external personality is. You're doing all the right things, but at the core, you're, you, you're, you're not, you haven't transformed yourself. So v'lachem, top of the next page, Omer Rabbi Yochanan Zake, eni yodeh cholo. Haf bishosu patera. So what Rabbi Yochanan Zake meant was, that I really don't know where I really am. <clears throat> Even though he spent his whole time learning Torah for 80 years teaching, he never stopped teaching, never stopped learning Torah. The fact that I'm busy learning Torah, okay, that's my conscious level of being. But that has no bearing. It's not a proof of where I am in my subconscious. Would anyone know that? I mean, he, he's a very holy man. He has no idea how yeah. could anyone ever know the no. essence of their soul. Possibly not. But is he talking about the... That's maybe what he's saying. The essence, really the essence, essence of his soul, or is he just talking about him? I mean, he knows that he's... I mean, he knows that he's Jewish. But okay. But, so what does that mean? That means that, that at, the, at the very depth of your soul was a divine spark. And that will, no matter what, that will come out eventually and will be connected to Hashem. 
but some but there are lay, there are layers and levels that cover that. And and so he's saying that just because my external self, the person that everybody knows, does all the right things and all is lovely and learning Torah and, and being good, doesn't mean that inside that's where I am. So yeah, he's not talking about the essence of the soul is divine. There's nothing wrong with any essence of the soul. But there are layers above that that are not revealed, uh, even if they're not the absolute essence. I don't, know, I don't think that etzim and nefeshim means the absolute essence of the soul. It means on the deeper level, on the subconscious level, I don't know where I am. And maybe the, you know, the reason he told his students this is to teach them this idea that you don't really know where you are. Yeah. What I've achieved in my life, maybe nothing. Should I done more? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there's a few things we see from here, from this. Rabbi Yochanan Zaka is telling us, first of all, that you don't really know where you are. Just because you're behaving doesn't mean inside you're, re- you're really there. And so he says, I don't know which way I'm going. But there's more. The fact that he says that because I don't know which way I'm going, I don't know where the essence of my soul, the inner layer of my soul is, my subconscious. I don't know where it's, where it's up to. Therefore, I don't know which way I'm going in the afterlife. That itself tells you that you are responsible for your subconscious self as well. Right. Yeah, right. So, meaning, uh, of course, he knows he's done mitzvahs, and of course, he'll be rewarded for his mitzvahs, and he'll, of course, he's learned a lot of Torah, and for that, he will be rewarded in the next life. There's no question about that, but he's also responsible for where his subconscious self is, his inner self is, and so, for that, I don't know. That might outweigh all the Torah and mitzvahs that I've done, and therefore, I will. I won't be going to a place of of reward. I'll have to first have some type of punishment. The fact that he's saying, I don't know which way I'm going to go because I don't know where I am internally means that where I am internally is my responsibility. Otherwise, how could you be punished for it? He's talking here about the reward in the afterlife. You're only rewarded for that which you are responsible. If you're not responsible, you you can't be rewarded or punished. So the fact that he's saying that because I don't know where I really am, therefore I don't know where I'm going, means that who you really are also determines where you go. As the Rebbe says, second line. So this level of our self, our subconscious self that we're not even aware of, being that we see that you could be punished or rewarded for that, brackets, from the very fact that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakeh said, I don't know which way I'm going in the afterlife, referring to I don't know what I really am. So the fact that he understood that I will be either punished or rewarded based on who I really am, not just based on what I look. So if there's reward and punishment for it, so that must mean this must mean that there is the possibility, the, the ability and the permission for every person to affect and determine that level of the soul as well. Because you can't be punished for something that you're not responsible for. You can't be rewarded for something that you didn't cause. So if Rabbi Yochanan Zaka is concerned about where he's going in the afterlife based on his inner core, that must mean that his inner core is also in his hands. I'm responsible for who I really am, not just for my behavior, but for my, for my inner self. And so if my behavior is all good, but my inner self is still rotten, I will be punished for that because I didn't purify my, my very core, my inner self. Which therefore must mean, the Rebbe says, Vahainu, sheyesh avoida kazusha pe'elas gam be'etzim anefesh. There must be some avoider, some spiritual work that we can do that impacts the essence of our soul. 
And through that avoda, through that particular work that we do, we actually elevate, put in line our inner self. Meaning, there must be some type of avoda, some way of serving Hashem, some work that we can do on ourselves that is not just a behavioral thing that you're doing the right thing, but you're actually becoming good internally as well. And how would he have missed that? Or what, how could he be questioning that? Well, he's saying, I don't know if I've done enough. All I can see, all, all I know is what I am on the surface. I can, I can tell you what I did today. I can tell you how I spent my life. I can account for every minute of my life. But do I know what I'm, the, the essence of, of my soul is? I don't know. I've never seen it. I don't, I don't know if I've, if I've done enough. I don't know if I've impacted it correctly. I don't know if I've purified myself. So I have to wait and see what, what it is because it's interesting why he didn't do that, see that, feel well, that. he did it, but how, how would he know it? How, how do you know what the etzim and nefesh is? can't see it. It's, it's not a visible thing. The, the, by definition, we're talking about here about the, 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 the invisible, subconscious part, part of you that's, that's not, not on the surface. So, so he may have done, done a lot to, tr- to, to improve that, but have I done enough? I don't know. I can tell you about my behavior. I can, I can tell you if I've controlled my behavior and I'm doing the right thing, that I can say. I can make an accounting. But th- that if the etzim and nefesh, if the essence of my soul is good or not, how do I know? It comes from the right place. What do you mean? What he's doing. Is that what it means? Like if the means what he's doing is coming really for, for the sake of Hashem. Well, well, no, because it might be for the sake of Hashem. The question is, am I just, am I a rotten person doing good things? I'm doing the right thing, but my, my person, myself, my etzim has, has not changed. Can you say that? How can you say that? Why not? A rotten person can do good things. So maybe, maybe I'm, I've controlled myself to the extent where every thought, every speech, every act that I do is according to the divine will. I'm, doing, I'm, I'm behaving correctly. But am I good? I don't know. You can't do that and be rotten. Sure, sure we can. We, we do it all the time. Sorry, at that level. At, at 80 years and, and being the leader. And sure you can. Sure you can. Uh, uh, there was a, a Kohen Gadol, a Bishmol Kohen Gadol, who after 80 years of being Kohen Gadol, became a heretic. He <laughs> gave it away. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> there's, something, there's something wrong there. Okay. Or there's a level called a Bainani. What is a Bainani? A Bainani is somebody who every thought... Every word, every act they do is according to the divine will. But they're not a tzaddik. That's what I'm saying. That we classified him as a tzaddik. I don't know if that was a well, list. That we, okay. It's probably was also a, a lesson. But, but he probably also didn't know. So, so he's saying, he's saying that, that I can't know. We, we can't know this. But by the fact that he's saying that... It's not, he's not just saying, if he, all he said was at the end of his life, you know what, I don't know if I'm really a tzaddik or not. That's nice, that's interesting. But he didn't say that. He said, I don't know where I'm going in the afterlife. It means that whether I'm a tzaddik or not, whether I've purified my inner self or not, that is something that matters to the afterlife. I'm responsible for it. I'll be punished if I'm not completely pure internally. Which means I'm responsible for it. It's in my hands. There are things that I can do, could have done, should have done more in order to make sure that my soul, the etzim and nefesh, is, is elevated, is purified. So, so even though he's saying he's res- like we're all responsible for it and you can affect it, you still don't actually know who it is. You don't know. You don't know. Yeah. Because how should you know? Mm. How can you know? It's like you can't know if you... You've done everything you were meant, to, even if you've done a lot, but you don't know if you've done absolutely everything you were meant to do in this life. No, but he's saying, doing I, I, I've done. On the, on the doing level, I, I, can, I can know. I can see what I've done. I can make a, an accounting. Yes. But how it's affected me, I don't know. Has my doing purified me? I, I don't know. How can I know that? So he's talking on the deepest level. He's not saying, was I rotten? It's like, clearly he probably saw himself as a good 
forgiving person as well, and B, I'm sure, I'm sure he saw the good that he did. That did. He did. The good that he did, he could yeah, see. The good that but he what was, I am, the good how, that he was how can as I well. That? Like, I'm sure he, he got a hunch maybe that he's <laughs> on the right track. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, he was crying, I don't know where I'm going. Right. After all that, I don't know. Rotten might be a, a strong yeah. term, but he said, I, I don't really know where I am. How can I know? I can account for my thoughts. My, I can account, account for my actions, but, but what I am, I don't see that. So that means it's in our control, and there's things we can do to elevate that self. So the second last line of that paragraph, this level of the soul, the level of the soul that is above consciousness, above awareness, and also the work that we can do to affect that level of ourselves, Nikras B'Shem Geirul, is called the level of Geirul, of the lot. Why, Why would it be called the lot? Because it's above logic. Right. That, it, that it's something that's above awareness, above logic, above, above, above judgment. Above control. It's not above control because we said that, that you, there are things you can do to affect it. <laughs> but the things you can do to affect it are girl things. It's a, it's a lottery. It's a level of lottery. It's an avoider called lottery. So both the level itself and the things you can do to affect it are called the lot. But you can't girl. know if it, it actually did something. Oh, yeah. yeah you, you can't know because it's above knowing. It's above awareness. <laughs> L- just like you can't say, look, I've done a lot of... Uh, I flipped a coin many times now. I know what's going to happen when I flip the coin. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't know. It, it's, it's, not a, it's not a level that you can know. It's, it's above your awareness. You can have it a guess, good guess. 50%? Yeah. <laughs> well, you can narrow it down to, to two options. We've got to talk about practical things. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes two people are fighting for a dozen dollars to save your side. Yeah, sure. 100% <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's definitely going to be one way or the other. So, Valpizim of Aretz HaMach Tzedek, in the Chalukas HaAretz HaShal Pigoro. Using this principle that the Alter Rebbe introduced, that there's a level of the soul that is above logic and above intellect called the level of Goro. There's an Avoida, a service of Hashem, that affects that level of our soul, which is called Goro. The Tzemach Tzedek says, and that is also the meaning of the division of the land of Israel through a girl, through a lottery. Meaning that, that the division of the land was, it wasn't just randomness, that it wasn't the idea. The idea was that there was some level of connection to the land that was above rationale, above logic. And it was that level that was utilized to divide up the land of Israel. Seems to learn also once with the Hamak. Mm. Yeah, correct. Same idea. Can you just say that last point again? That well, it's not really explained here, oh, that's right. but it just says that the Tzemach Tzedek says that the division of the land by Goral meant a connection between the Jewish people and the land was on the level of Goral, which that level that is above rationale, above logic. The Etzim and Efesh, the, the essence of the soul. That's our connection to the land, and so just like the Alter Rebbe explained the concept of Gerl being the level of Rabbi Yechim Zaka where he says, I don't know where I really am. There's a level that we don't know, we're not aware of. Uh, our connection to the land is also one that is super rational. And that's why it was divided by Gerl. Now, the, the rest of the Maira is going to explain more the, the connection. Let's go into Gimel. So, what, what is really the, the connection between the three levels of girl of lottery that we've now explained. What are the three levels? Hagerl ben nefesh, uba voidus adam, uba chalukas aretz. We said that the girl, the lot, appears in three places. There's a level of the lottery in our soul, which is the level that we don't know where we really are. There's the level of lottery in our service of Hashem, which is the type of work we can do to affect that level of our soul that we don't know. And there's the division of the land that was also through lottery. What's the connection between these three things? 
So to understand that we have to understand this. Everything that there is in the world is found in the Jewish soul. Everything that exists in the world is found in our soul. Because we're told that the world was created for the Jewish soul to keep Torah, so therefore everything there is in the world is there for us to elevate. Our job is to, is to elevate and bring meaning and purpose to the entire universe. So therefore there must be everything in the world in our soul. There must be a connection between us and, and the world. So we are a microcosm. The Jewish soul is a microcosm that contains in it aspects of the universe. And by working on things within ourselves, we elevate the world. So, so certainly, the part of the world that is particularly connected to the Jewish people is certainly found in the soul of the Jewish people. Meaning the land of Israel, which is a part of the world, but it's the part of the world that's directly connected to us. So certainly, the land of Israel is found in our soul as well. There is, there is a, a spiritual version of the land of Israel found within our soul. Chazal, like it says, in the Medrash, when Hashem created the world, He divided up the various lands. And He chose the land of Israel as to be His holy land. And of all the nations, Hashem chose the Jewish people. And so He said that the people of Israel, who are my portion, who I've chosen, should go and live in the land of Israel, which is my portion. And that's why Hashem gave the land of Canaan to Avram Avinu, to him, his children, and all generations forever as an inheritance. Meaning that, that there's a portion of land in the world that is the chosen portion. And there's the people in the world that are the chosen people. And so this one belongs to that one. Why? Why did Hashem get involved with territorial issues in the first place? Why, why, why does, what does it matter to Hashem where we live? Because the world is a reflection of the soul, and the soul is a reflection of the world. If in, uh, in the, in the, in, if there's a nation that is a chosen nation, there must be a land that is a chosen land. And the chosen nation should be in the chosen land. So from this is understood, that what goes on in the land of Israel is a reflection of what's going on in the Jewish soul. And so to the other way around, the things going on within the Jewish soul are also fitting with what's going on in the land of Israel. So, in other words, the land of Israel is a depiction uh, of the turmoil of the Jewish soul, what's happening within, and the other way around as well. That, that our soul is is a reflection of what's of what's happening in the land. So, so therefore, when we talk about the land of Israel, the literal physical land, when the land of Canaan was conquered to make it into the land of Israel, there were three things that had to be done in order to divide up the land. There was a lottery, there was divine inspiration, and there was a fair intellectual logical division. Which we said was that the big portion goes to the larger tribe, the smaller to the smaller tribe. It must mean that in our inner soul, there is Goro, a lottery, there's Ruch HaKodesh, prophecy, and there is logic, fairness, rational division. And this is talking about it in the, in the spiritual level of the Jewish people. And even the fact that there were bigger tribes and smaller tribes 
because that existed in the, in the division of the land, as far as the physical number of a particular tribe, so certainly this must also exist in the spiritual level, in the soul, and the shamash is zeha which is the main thing. So <laughs> when we talk about if a, if a bigger tribe gets a bigger portion in the land of Israel, what, just because there's lots of people, so you get more land? Well, in, in the physical world, that makes sense. But that must represent also in the spiritual, there must be a largeness spiritually that connects to a larger part of the land of Israel. There must be a, a bigness of soul as well that gets more portion. Because if that's true of the body, it must, must, must be true of the soul, because the body is just the external self. So all of this must, must uh, fit together. Um, after the brackets, and a kivan should tachlis the Yisrael who command Razal, unnivrais l'shamas koni, because the entire purpose of the existence of the Jewish people is, as our sages say, I was only created to serve my Creator, to serve God. Hari mulut, so obviously, Hari, shekol gimel dvarim anal, yeshtam gamba inyin l'shamas koni, bevodus Hashem. These three things must exist in our service of Hashem. There must be a service of Hashem called Geirot, service of Hashem called Ruach HaKodesh, and service of Hashem called Seichel. So, so we've set up the scene that the Jewish soul is a reflection of the land of Israel. Whatever happens in the land happens in the soul and vice versa. So therefore, if the land of Israel was divided up through Geirot, Ruach HaKodesh, and Seichel, so that must mean in our soul there are three levels. Geirot, Ruch, Kodesh, and Seichel. And because our entire purpose of existence is to serve Hashem, so if there's these three things in our soul, it must be that there's three ways of serving Hashem with these three aspects to ourselves. There's a way of serving Hashem, which is called Geirot, there's the Ruch, Kodesh, and the Seichel. And what these are, we'll see God willing in the rest of the moment. So he was talking about the level of Geirot. Yeah.